The Fulbright Association welcomes you to a live broadcast from Berlin, Germany, the 2018 Fulbright Prize for International Understanding, honoring Angela Merkel, Chancellor of Germany, with generous support from ASIS, the Franz Collection, these sponsors, and University of Maryland University College, which today serves 90,000 adult learners including members of the U.S. military around the world. UMUC congratulates Dr. Merkel on this honor and salutes the Fulbright Association as a champion of international education. As we commemorate our university's 70th anniversary of service to U.S. military personnel in Europe, we proudly stand together with the Fulbright Association, united by a common belief in the power of education to change lives and to make our world a better, brighter place. Good evening. I freue mich, dass Sie alle here in Berlin and the Zuschauer weltweit zur Verleihung des Fulbright Prizes here in Berlin and all viewers around the world to be awarding the 2018 J. William Fulbright Prize for International Understanding. Here and connected online around the world, let me welcome you to Berlin and the award ceremony of the 2018 J. William Fulbright Prize for International Understanding, honoring Chancellor Angela Merkel. My name is Manfred Philip. I'm the immediate past president of the Fulbright Association and a member of the Fulbright Prize International Selection Committee. On behalf of the Fulbright Association, I wish to thank all of you for joining us this evening, especially those who have traveled great distances. We're honored by the presence of many distinguished guests from Germany and around the world including the Honorable Richard Grinnell, the United States Ambassador to Germany. Many thanks to those who have made this event possible, including our donors, our sponsors, ACES, the France Collection, the University of Maryland University College, Thrive and Financial, Auburn University, the South Carolina and National Capital Area chapters of the Fulbright Association, and others. We're very grateful to the German-American Fulbright Commission and the staff of the Federal Chancellery for their assistance. Thanks to the team at the Fulbright Association office in Washington, especially John Bader, the Executive Director, and Chaz Akram, the Deputy Executive Director. I also thank the past and present members of the board of the Fulbright Association who are here, and there are quite a few. Senator Fulbright believed that ordinary people, that is to say you and me, have the right and responsibility to build a peaceful world. Since 1946, the Fulbright program has enabled over 380,000 people worldwide to share that responsibility, traveling to teach, to discover, and to learn. Founded in 1977 with the support of Senator Fulbright himself, our association is the official alumni organization of US grantees. We are committed to expanding the impact of the Fulbright experience through our educational programs and to ensuring its future with advocacy to the US Congress. We believe that international experiences in unfamiliar settings with people we struggle to understand help to develop leaders who have perspective and empathy. That is why in 1993, our Fulbright Association began recognizing extraordinary world leaders by awarding the first Fulbright Prize to Nelson Mandela. Mandela and the laureates who followed, Jimmy Carter, Corazon Aquino, Vaclav Havel, Mary Robinson and others, all have those qualities. The Fulbright Association draws inspiration from them as we do our own community's work to build friendships and understanding and ultimately a better world. Thank you so much.
sehr geehrte Bundeskanzlerin, Madam Chancellor, werte Anwesende, Mr. Grinnell, ladies, and ladies and gentlemen, mein Name ist Oliver Schmidt, ich I'm bin Oliver Direktor Schmidt. der deutsch-amerikanischen Fulbright-Kommission Fulbright und begrüße Sie sehr, and sehr herzlich like very zu diesem this, uh, event. Turning nations into people. Turning nations into people. Dieses Credo von Senator J. William Fulbright ist zeitlos und es ist bis heute brandaktuell. The German American Fulbright Commission, founded in the wake of World War II, was built on Senator Fulbright's vision of, yes, turning nations into people. As one of 49 binational commissions worldwide, Fulbright Germany was established in 1952 by executive agreement, einem Staatsvertrag, signed by the German Chancellor Konrad Adenauer and the then US High Commissioner in Germany, John McCloy. They agreed, and I quote, they agreed to promote mutual understanding between the people of the United States of America and the Federal Republic of Germany by a wider exchange of knowledge and professional talents. All Fulbright Commissions are unique because here two countries share one responsibility for one joint program. They share decisions and they share funding. On behalf of all alumni in the room, all grantees, I would like to thank our two governments, Chancellor Merkel, Ambassador Grinnell, for continued strong support over more than 67 years. <laughs> now, when I look around, I'm delighted, I'm really delighted to see a Fulbright community from all over the world. To all of you who have come from afar, welcome, welcome to Berlin. And I also see my fellow colleagues, my fellow directors from Finland, from Austria, from Canada. And I see a lot of grantees and alumni across disciplines and across generations. Among them, university presidents like Gerhard Kasper and Christian Thompson, the journalist and longtime TV anchor Ulrich Wickert, or filmmaker Doris Dörrie. All of you, all of us are here to honor Angela Merkel. Our Fulbright Commission in Berlin is the largest commission in the history of the Fulbright program. Each year, more than 700 grantees cross the Atlantic in both directions. Students, scholars and scientists, educators, journalists, teachers, and professionals in higher education. Some of them strive with individual grants for academic excellence. Others, again, set out on road trips throughout Europe, across the Midwest, or all the way to the West Coast to meet people in their everyday lives. Turning nations into people. You all in this hall stand for a deeply rooted and vibrant community that has brought Americans and Germans closer together. Ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate your attention and invite you now to hear from Manuel Pauser, one of our 46,000 alumni, about his personal experience. Thank you all very much. Vielen herzlichen Dank. Madam Chancellor, Ambassador, Fulbrighters and friends. I feel privileged and honored to speak here today because who I am today is in large part owed to my time in the United States, which would have been impossible without the Fulbright program. My name is Manuel Pauser. Ich stamme aus my name is Manuel Pauser. I come from Mecklenburg, Western Pomerania, and I am an alumni of the University of Greifswald and of Syracuse University in upstate New York. 
where I spent a year as an exchange student when I was 17. Living in a country and culture that is so fundamentally different from where I come from, but that is yet part of a globalized world, convinced me to go to the US to study international relations. The Fulbright program helped to finance my studies, something my parents would have been never able to do. In fact, I was the first in my family to ever go to university. But the Fulbright program did actually much more than that. It put me in a classroom in Starkville, Mississippi, with Fulbrighters from all over the world. It sent me to the Maxwell School in Syracuse and allowed me to start my professional career in Washington, D.C. And it helped me grow as an academic, as a professional, and as a person. But above all, it allowed me to understand and appreciate what America is about. And while I had some very powerful and inspiring experiences, like sitting down with Secretary Condoleezza Rice or experiencing a presidential inauguration, for me, this was not what America essentially is. If you want to find out what the American soul is, you have to dance in a nightclub in Mississippi <laughs> or listen to a wedding sermon in Kansas or digest a sumptuous Thanksgiving meal with friends in Idaho or drive down a sheer endless highway in Wyoming. And yes, you may find contradictions, you may find curiosities and opinions you may or may not agree with. Indeed, the American soul is complex, but the American heart is good. Ladies and gentlemen, the Fulbright Association recognizes today our Chancellor's leadership and commitment to mutual understanding um, in uh, international relations. In the age of social media, let us take this as an opportunity to recognize the importance of mutual understanding, of open hearts and open minds in the relations between our countries, our people, and between each and every one of us. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Renee Fleming, speaking to you from the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts in Washington, D.C. Ich möchte Bundeskanzlerin Angela Merkel herzlich gratulieren, dass sie die Empfängerin des Fulbright Preises 2018 ist. I would like to offer my sincere congratulations to Chancellor Angela Merkel as she receives the Fulbright Prize for Peace and Understanding. Chancellor Merkel, it was an honor to see you most recently at the concert marking the 25th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. To me and to countless others, your leadership and achievement rank with that milestone event in the history of the progress toward peace. Your record of thoughtful, constructive engagement is a beacon for leaders the world over and a shining example to women and men everywhere of what can be achieved when strength and empathy go hand in hand. It was a Fulbright scholarship that first brought me to Germany to study the language and the culture. And I am proud that the Fulbright Association continues to promote international cooperation, awarding this prize to a world leader who so richly deserves it. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Mary Ellen Hyenschmieder. I had the privilege to chair the International Selection Committee for the Fulbright Prize this time. And I want to take the moment to thank all the members of that committee who are named in your program, and several of them are present here tonight. They represent the global reach of the Fulbright Program, from Taiwan to Kosovo, to Finland, to Hungary, to the United States. Thank you so much to the committee for their work. With this award, the Fulbright Association honors Chancellor Angela Merkel for her significant career. As the nomination letter documented, she is known for remarkable, compassionate leadership, and strong commitment to mutual understanding, international cooperation, and peace. 
Chancellor Merkel has embodied the best of leadership from the start, and she has continued to operate within her values as they're tested anew with the unremitting challenges and crises of our time. Our members, friends, and the board have traveled overseas to honor the laureate for the first time in the 25 year history of giving the prize. And it's particularly appropriate because as Oliver has told you, the number of alumni of the German American exchanges is the largest after of course the Americans who created about 140,000 alumni. We've gone all over the world from the beginning of this program. The location in Berlin also allows us to spend time with more alumni and more Fulbright program people from all different parts of Europe as well as the rest of the world. For over 70 years now, the range of impact of the Fulbright program has grown to include exchanges in 165 countries. So it is particularly wonderful to greet so many of you from all over the world here this evening celebrating. And now, I'm honored to introduce someone who is equally committed to international understanding, Christiane Amanpour. What a moment to see two of the world's most influential and accomplished women on the same stage, epitomizing the award we bestow. We are delighted and grateful that Christiane is here to reflect on leadership and the exceptional contributions of Angela Merkel. Hers is the perspective of a premier international journalist reporting actually throughout the years of the Chancellor's leadership in the heart of Europe and beyond. Christine is widely recognized for the fierce intelligence, analytic balance, and deep respect for conflicting perspectives that she has brought to the narratives behind the headlines. Her interviews on CNN and PBS continue to hold the powerful accountable and set the world's standard for insight. So please join me now in welcoming Christiane Amanpour to the stage. Thank you so very much. To Chancellor Merkel, Ambassador, Fulbrighters, Ladies and gentlemen, my colleagues in the press back there, I am so, so honored to be here, to be able to do this and to be able to introduce a woman I admire so much in a country that I admire so much for everything that it has achieved and everything it has done in our modern history. But what can I say about a woman named Angela Merkel? That she is the first woman chancellor? That she is the first Osti chancellor? that she will soon tie the record as the longest serving chancellor, that she is a scientist, the first scientist chancellor. Who knew that that today would be so incredibly relevant? What a political tool to be so committed to facts and empirical truth. What a coat of armor in a world where the basic pillars of our democracy, truth, facts, democracy itself are under assault and we all have to defend them. I was a very, very young wannabe foreign correspondent when the Berlin Wall came down in 1989. I wasn't here, I was in New York waiting and wishing and wanting to be here with all my other colleagues. And I remember the people on the streets of New York completely mesmerized. They couldn't get over what had just happened here in Berlin. I remember everybody saying, wow, man, did you see that wall come down? It was incredible. But Angela Merkel was here and she crossed. I mean, I hope I'm not betraying any secrets. It is public knowledge. I think, Madam Chancellor, you might have been in a sauna the night that the Berlin Wall came down. <laughs> but as soon as you heard about it, you got up and went across to experience the excitement and the freedom that you had never known. I did come though in time to cover German reunification and even long before I watched in awe as your predecessor, Chancellor Kohl, held hands with the French president Francois Mitterrand and vowed together to put aside the years of division and hatred, instead looking at a future of hope and reconciliation and peace. Later afterwards, 
I remember covering the first ever deployment of German troops after World War II. They were deployed as part of the NATO peacekeeping force in Kosovo. And I remember what an incredible moment that was and how emotional that was given the history and how the women and the children and the people who had been so badly tortured and beaten and terrified by what was going on welcomed those German troops as people who had helped liberate them and who are now going to help them walk through those very, very difficult steps to post-war reconciliation and peace. Over the years, I've also covered Germany's deep love and, aff and affection for the United States of America. Gratitude for the Marshall Plan that single-handedly rebuilt this country after World War II. Gratitude for the devotion of the United States that brought democracy to a country that had never known it. And as a reward, has seen a country, Germany, defend democracy, human rights, freedom, and truth, perhaps more staunchly than any other democratic country that exists in the world. And Chancellor Merkel has defended that legacy throughout her time in office. She's championed the promise of reconciliation in a way that distinguishes her as a Fulbright laureate who's committed to these issues and ideas that keep the peace on our continent and in the world. As the organization itself says about its own founder, William Fulbright, Senator Fulbright was a politician to be sure, but he was also a gifted thinker, a writer and an orator. He valued opportunities to think broadly about issues, taking the time to think deeply about where we are going as peoples and how we can achieve great goals together. Surely, that too is the definition of the transatlantic alliance that Germany and Chancellor Merkel are central to. For 14 years, Chancellor Merkel has been the face and the enforcer of that engagement. Even in times of deep disagreement with America, many, many of the years that I covered and that I followed as an international correspondent, for instance, during the Iraq war years of President George W. Bush, Chancellor Merkel kept good relations between the Allies and even good personal relations. Who can forget the famous shoulder rub? <laughs> then, in 2008, when candidate Obama came here wanting to rally a different kind of audience, Chancellor Merkel said no to using the Brandenburg Gate as a campaign backdrop, as a set. But she did allow candidate Obama to go to the victory column, the victory monument, and I was there to cover that. And I watched an unprecedented turnout of American and, and German citizens, hundreds of thousands of people, come to watch relations between the two countries get patched up together again. It takes the right leaders and it takes the right policies. And even in the age of disruption with President Trump, Angela Merkel kept the strategic alliance between the United States and Germany, between the United States and Europe in the forefront. And she was the only one of the allied leaders, the Western leaders, who welcomed President Trump's election conditionally on his commitment to uphold shared values. This is what she said that day, that night in November of 2016. Germany's ties with the United States of America are deeper than with any country outside of the European Union. Germany and America are bound by common values, democracy, freedom, as well as respect for the rule of law and the dignity of each and every person, regardless of their origin, skin color, creed, gender, sexual orientation, or political views. It is based on these values that I wish to offer close cooperation, both with me personally and between our country's governments. And she went on to wish President Trump Godspeed in the difficult task and challenge of leadership. I've covered Chancellor Merkel from afar, and I wholeheartedly second the Fulbright citation that honors her for her remarkable compassionate leadership and her strong commitment to mutual understanding, international cooperation, and peace. Today, in the face of unprecedented threats to democracy from our own Western allies even, and within our own countries, Angela Merkel remains a steadfast warrior. Just last week, with President Emmanuel Macron of France, she said, populism and nationalism are strengthening in all of our countries, 74 years, a single human lifetime after the end of the Second World War, what seems self-evident is being called into question once more. Bosnia was my coming of age. In Bosnia, we saw nationalism in Europe, and nationalism means war. I saw it, I watched it, I witnessed it. I am committed to the kind of peace 
that Chancellor Merkel believes in, defends, and upholds. Now, there will one day come a post-Merkel era, but the Chancellor is not going quietly into that dark night. She intends to keep up her defense of our fundamental principles and our values, whether it is, as I've said, democracy, human rights, or climate and migration and the combat, the joint combat against terrorism. I'd like to end also with some heartwarming stories, the many stories of refugees that I've covered, whether here in Germany, whether in the United Kingdom, where I'm now based, or whether in the United States, where I work a lot. They have, for the overwhelming part, enriched their host nations. And I'm delighted to say, for instance, that I recently saw on ABC News Good Morning America that the little tiny town, I think it's tiny, of Knoxville, Kentucky, has voted Yassine's falafel joint as the nicest place in America. In London, outside, he's a Syrian refugee. In London, outside my own CNN office, another group of refugees came and created Imad's Kitchen Chooses Love. And there are lines around the block to Imad's Kitchen. We can't get in for love nor money. As people in the neighborhood queue up to get their falafel sandwich for five pounds, and all that money goes to Syrian refugees and the people who are serving are doing it as volunteers. Here in Berlin, when I was doing a recent series, I came across a fantastic woman, about 50 years old, a Syrian refugee who came from Damascus, chased out of her own home. And she ran into Klaus, a German guy, Muslim woman, Christian German. And they got married in the little village in the hinterlands and they have enriched, according to all their neighbors, their tiny community and their neighborhood. Angela Merkel had the courage and the compassion to allow them in. I've spent my career covering refugees and people who flee war and disaster. And I know that people don't just run away from their countries to buy a Mercedes or a Mealy washing machine, or even to follow their favorite German soccer team. Angela Merkel set the standard for how we in the rich world can and should treat our most desperate citizens. If other European nations had shared the burden, perhaps the backlash wouldn't have been so fierce. And I've just had my own ancestry and my own roots traced for the American program, Finding Your Roots. The host and the distinguished Harvard historian, Henry Louis, Louis Gates, reminds us that, quote, under the skin, we are almost identical genetically. And that is the strongest argument for brotherhood, sisterhood, and the unity of the human species. So Chancellor Merkel, thank you for reminding us of that every day with your leadership. And now I have the pleasure and the privilege of welcoming Chancellor Merkel to the stage as the 2018 Fulbright Associate Laureate. Willkommen. And if I could just also ask, Mr. Schmeider, Mr. Philipp, Mr. Schmidt, Ms. Amanpour, Ambassador, ladies and gentlemen, dear Fulbright community, dear guests, this is a moving moment for me, and I would like to thank you for making, in many cases, uh, a very long trip covering very 
great distances to honor me and in this way honoring also my home country, Germany. Um, you have found an excellent organization here. Um, when you see Mr. Pauser, who comes from my constituency, Greifswald, after all, is in my constituency. And the sort of story that he told us is a sort of moving story that is in many ways emblematic for uh, today's time. I mean, um, Greifswald is actually uh, a venerable Hanseatic town, uh, and which the world may not know, but it is part and parcel of this modern world now and is contributing through the world as we know today. And then obviously the greetings of Rene Fleming, um, whose uh, voice um, I cherish so much, uh, having her uh, among us and you, Ms. Amanpour, with those very gracious words you found for me. Uh, I usually only see you on television uh, from a great distance, so thank you for taking the trouble to come here tonight and to um, well, uh, put my political work in perspective Fulbright. The Fulbright Prize is the very symbol of how important international understanding is. Understand understanding in and of itself obviously is not sufficient, but as one would say in um, mathematics, it is necessary for a peaceful uh, coexistence on a small scale in one's private life, but also among nations. And William Fulbright, as a young um, scholarship holder and a student in Oxford himself, experienced how across borders, across continents, getting to know each other, um, fostered understanding and also trust. And uh, against the background of this experience, he initiated shortly after the Second World War, a program that to this day is one of the most successful exchange programs the world over. I think we always have to think back to those days when this program was initiated in the immediate post-war period, a time where one would think that hatred uh, or suspicion uh, would carry the day, but there were still people at the time, and we still benefit uh, from their farsightedness today, who, after this catastrophe uh, that was unleashed by the Germans, they still made reconciliation and understanding possible. Understanding, getting to know each other is something that states can promote, uh, but they cannot impose it. And so you always need people to fill this with life, people who show an open-mindedness, who are open to share experiences with others. You need students, you need pupils, you need professors, you need professionals from all walks of life who are bold enough, who are courageous enough to um, set out into the unknown, to go to other countries, to live there, to work, and to make something out of their lives. And what a rewarding experience it is for um, each individual if this works out, particularly when new, when new acquaintances become friends and we know that such experiences will last you a lifetime. Openness towards other cultures and civilizations, empathy uh, towards other nations, also a feeling of gratitude because one was able to broaden one's own horizon. This is what remains. Um, and when you're uh, experienced in another country and its realities, uh, well, you cannot really nurture your um, preconceived notions. Uh, um, there will be a certain correction mechanism setting in. And it's most important that at this point in time, in this particular moment in time, we do this again. Because if you get to know other countries, if you get to know other people, they will also see you invariably as an ambassador, because in a way you lend your face, your voice um, to um, the message you carry a from your own home country. And then we, when you come back, you have these experiences that you bring back home that you can share with others. So every successful exchange promotes getting to know and understanding um, between our countries and is another bond in this most important network of international relations. And Senator Fulbright firmly believed um, in such a citizen's diplomacy, as it were. The idea not, not only politicians and diplomats uh, contribute uh, to bringing about peace, but all citizens, all of those who uh, nurture and build on uh, cross-border friendships. Easier said than done. Behind this openness towards the world, however, is a great cultural achievement, an achievement that has been constantly filled with life and continues to be filled with life by Americans and Germans. Many uh, American citizens 
consider Germany to be their second home. In Berlin alone, um, 20,000 Americans live. Uh, more than 10,000 Germans study at American universities, even more young Americans study in German universities, around 12,600. Americans and Germans study with each other, do research with, e with each other, work, um, so they renew um, our relations every day. And the Fulbright program gives a very important contribution to this, a crucial contribution. The exchange with Germany, as it has already been said, is particularly intensive, more than 46,000 scholarships um, the Fulbright Commission gave to Germans and Americans. And that shows the very great interest um, our two countries have and uh, the citizens of our two countries have uh, with the respective countries. Um, the United States and Germany are linked by partnership and friendship for more than 70 years. 1946, only one year after the end of the Second World War, the Fulbright program was already launched. And that very same year, the then Secretary of State, James Francis Burns, L gave a speech in Germany that ended with the following words, and let me quote him, and this in 1946, and I quote, the American people want to return the government of Germany to the German people. The American people want to help the German people to win their way back to an honorable place among the free and peace-loving nations of the world." End of quote. These words became known as the speech of hope, hope for a future for a country that had been destroyed by a war that it had unleashed itself, hope for a country that politically, economically, and morally was completely crushed. But why should one give help to a better future to this country, a former enemy in a war that brought so much suffering over the world? There were, have always been understandable doubts and uh, reservations um, throughout our common history. But the fact that the answer that was given was a very positive one was due to extraordinary courage and political farsightedness. Germany was to take its destiny into its own hands again. It was to build up a democracy. It was to grow into a partner that would then become part of a free and prosperous Europe. And this is how our country, in a very special way, experienced how important trust and confidence is. And this is what the United States and also the other Western allies showed to Germany and they demonstrated it in both words and deeds. The Fulbright program is an expression of this trust. Let me remind all of us on the Marshall Plan and the many Allied soldiers that was stationed during the Cold War in Germany. Let us remember the airlift that uh, 70 years ago during the blockade of Berlin supplied the city with vital goods by air keeping the hope for freedom in the city alive. And um, the legendary commitment of the American President John F. Kennedy will also never be forgotten. Ich bin ein Berliner. In 2019, on the 9th of November, we shall celebrate the 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. We are here at a very symbolic location, as you probably know very close to the Brandenburg Gate. This gate that was closed for decades and has now been open for the past 30 years is a symbol for the freedom of the city, for unification of Germany, for overcoming the division of Europe, and for all of this happening because of our American friends standing next to us relentlessly, standing up for a free Europe making this free Europe strong, and we Germans shall never forget this. Only recently, when on a very sad occasion I traveled to Washington uh, for the funeral ceremony of uh, George Herbert Walker Bush, we were able to remind ourselves that he was one of the great figures who worked for German unification together with uh, Chancellor Kohl, offering us partnership in leadership at the time. All of this is part and parcel of our history. That is part of our present presence as well. 
but we also know that the young generation uh, doesn't see this transatlantic partnership as uh, such um, a given, um, as such a matter of course, as the older generation. We know that um, priorities have shifted, um, particularly from the American perspective, for a very good reason. The Pacific area is just as much a challenge as the European area. After the end of the Cold War, um, priorities have shifted somewhat. Um, and, and that has always been the case in the past, incidentally, as well. We are not always of one and the same opinion as regards pondering and balancing out national and international interests. But allow me, if I may, to tell you that six, Germany, little by little, in particular after the end of the, show, of the Cold War, shouldered more responsibility. Christiana Mampur just reminded us uh, when the first uh, German troops arrived in Kosovo. At the time, this was a very tough fight. I was uh, very much a junior member in the government. So we were pon we were grappling with uh, whether we should allow ships, uh, vessels to go to the Adriatic Sea um, with soldiers. These days, it's a matter of course that not only on the Western Balkans we're present with our allies, allies but also in Afghanistan, because um, following um, the invocation of Chapter 5, um, and we are now there with our American allies, and we're in Mali present, and we know that we need to do more. We wish and we want to shoulder responsibility, and we will do so. Uh, this is demonstrated by the increasing defense budget and also by the increase in our budget for economic cooperation and development aid. And we want to stand up for our freedom because we also want to defend and stand up for our values. But we also have to be aware of, to be aware of the fact that 80 years after the beginning of the Second World War, many of the lessons of history seem to fade into the background. Um, they no longer seem to be um, convincing people um, these days. We have less and less contemporary witnesses of the unimaginable crimes that Germans committed during the National Socialist period, and there are less and less people among us who have uh, their own experience of the avalanche of destruction an inhumane ideology, ideology can unleash. Today, therefore, we who are in political responsibility have to show that we have learned the history from the First and Second World War. We have to shoulder responsibility for maintaining and preserving peace in this world. Because we can count ourselves lucky that in our countries we are able to live in peace and freedom, but this is not a matter of course. We have to work for this time and time again. We have to remain vigilant, wide awake as regards social developments within our countries, but also outside of our countries. And that too is part and parcel of the analysis of present-day politics, also here in Germany. Uh, we do see an increase in excessive populism and nationalism that tends to marginalize others. Um, the thinking in national spheres of influence seems to gain prominence over international and humanitarian law. And we have to stand up resolutely against this type of thinking. We should and we ought to remind ourselves of the fact why the United Nations were established in the first place, why NATO, why the World Trade Organization and other international institutions, because of the lessons that were drawn out of the horrors of the Second World War and excessive nationalism, acting together, multilateralism, that was the response to the horrors of the first half of the 20th century. And for me, this is still true today. We need international rules in order to settle conflicts of interest peacefully. And in order to be able to do this, we need international institutions that are strong enough to act. Of course, these international organizations also have to be uh, adapted to modern day challenges. They have to be reformed, they have to be further developed, because the challenges of our present day reality are changing over time, after all. These are challenges that, and I'm firmly convinced that of this, um, cannot be tackled, cannot be mastered by nations going it alone. These are challenges uh, that we are all duty bound um, to uh, tackle, to master, and 
no country can act as if uh, this wasn't concerning it, um, and I'm saying this also for Germany, or as if this was an, e an inevitable fate uh, that one simply has to accept. No, globalization, digitalization, economic development are made by men, are made by individuals, uh, and wars, crises also uh, are made by human beings, so we should do everything in our power, everything that we um, as human beings are capable of to tackle and master these common challenges together. And this is why I always argue the case of our, in our interconnected world, seeing that um, there is, of, co of course, a national common good, but there is also a global common good. Obviously, each and every country has its own uh, political priorities, but global needs and necessities and national interests must not be in any way contradictory to each other. I'm quite convinced that uh, working for the global common good also has positive effects on the national common good. And patriotism for me always means thinking your own vested national interests also uh, together with the vested interests of others. And this is why I will never tire of making a case for a strengthening of multilateral um, rules-based um, and value-based global order. This, ladies and gentlemen, also is true for the European Union, because after all, the European Union too was founded um, uh, because of the lessons learned from the horrors of the 20th century. And this is why, uh, well, uh, Europe and Germany are multilateral projects, if you like. And we here in Germany know that we can, in the long run, only prosper if Europe also prospers. I'm convinced that the idea of the European integration is the best idea we ever had on this continent. Of course, on this path towards a further development of the European Union, we also have to contend with certain setbacks. The decision of the British citizens to leave the European Union, for example, is one such setback. Uh, but we have to respect this, and this is why we will do our utmost, um, even once uh, Britain has left the European Union, to build good uh, relations to our then neighboring country, built on trust. Theresa May, uh, for a very good reason, says we remain part of Europe, and uh, this is true for the economic um, area, it's true for the context uh, between our civil societies, in the security area, in the foreign political area, and in many areas where we can forge a very close cooperation. And of course, Europe um, is sometimes um, a cumbersome project. I spent many, many nights there in order to try and come to some agreement after long and arduous negotiations. But we've always proved that we are able to strike compromises. So we are finding uh, good, sustainable solutions and responses to questions with which um, individual countries themselves uh, could not cope. Um, and I mean, we're negotiating uh, time and again also um, things that we had thought were quite natural. For example, um, is a compromise a good thing? I think we ought to hold compromises in high regard because after all, they're of, is absolutely essential. They're crucial for people living together peacefully. We can say Europe is too complicated a project, let's do this in, in Germany. We will then immediately see that the federal government and the lender government already need nights in order to negotiate results. Then you say, well, just negotiate with the, the government. We need, um, well, coalition committees that meet overnight. And if you say we don't want any compromise at all, uh, we don't need it outside of politics, well, remember the way that your average family spends the weekend. Without some kind of compromise, you will not be able to agree on lunch, and you will not be able to agree on the family outing. So if you want to be on your own all the time, alone, well, then you don't need to strike compromises unless you're a schizophrenic personality, obviously. Um, but the minute you wish to live together with others, a compromise will be necessary. So, ladies and gentlemen, in this world of change, 
of change. Only a united Europe can be a strong Europe, a Europe that holds its own um, in freedom and self-determination with its values. As a partner and friend of the United States, Europe can only be as strong as it is united. The transatlantic partnership rests on a foundation of shared values on democracy, on human rights, on freedom. And because this is the case, we, uh, Germany, Europe and the United States could never wish for better partners. And this is in spite of all the differences that one has, as one has them in any kind of partnership, um, we should never forget. Particularly now, where in our transatlantic relationship, um, we need to talk with one another. We need meetings, encounters, lines of communication, and such lines of communications uh, we wish to establish with uh, the so-called Germany here uh, that are currently uh, that we currently um, hold in the United States. Uh, the motto Wunderbar Together um, should allow us to uh, get um, together with as many Americans as possible. More than 1,000 events will not only take place in the big cities, but all over the country. And just as Senator Fulbright, I am firmly convinced that it is meetings among citizens that uh, turn states of the world into a true community of states. So the Fulbright program is not only a blessing for generations of grantees, but also for our relations among our nations. So let me repeat yet again, it is a great honor and privilege um, for me to be awarded with the Fulbright Prize for International Understanding. Um, the fact that the first um, um, awardee was Nelson Mandela obviously makes this an even greater honor. In addition, um, I am very grateful that so many of you have come such a long way uh, to uh, this award ceremony here in Germany. Um, Maybe Senator Fulbright has never been as modern as he is today. It is a good thing that he um, was there, and it is a good thing that we commemorate his actions here today. Thank you. Our thanks are small compared to what you have done for the world. We thank you. The 2018 J. William Fulbright Prize for International Understanding Laureate, Dr. Merkel. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to thank also Christiane Amanpour for her words introducing the Chancellor. And for all of you. <laughs> and for all of you who have traveled to be here for this remarkable evening. Thank you to all of you for being here. And now I'd like to talk just for a minute about Senator Fulbright, who is represented here in the, in the sculpture. From the beginning, in his first argument for an educational and cultural exchange program to grow out of the chaos after the end of World War II in Europe, he was able to manage that, partly because he was able to put his vision into memorable words. And the words of Fulbright have continued to resonate with alumni, with governments, with commission executives, with friends and supporters of the program. And so I'd like to close by reading what he said about the program. Our future is not in the stars, but in our own minds and hearts. Creative leadership, and liberal education, which in fact go together, are the first requirements for a hopeful future for humankind. Fostering these, leadership, learning, and empathy between cultures was and remains the purpose of the Fulbright program.
So we salute Chancellor Merkel for having lived a life in global leadership, working to build a hopeful future and a more peaceful world. Thank you again. And now I have just two short uh, explanationary moments. One is that we need to stay seated uh, while the Chancellor departs, but before she does, she has agreed to two specific photographs that we need to have you stay seated while they quickly occur on the stage. And then uh, as she departs from this side, I invite all of you out this side to enjoy the refreshments that we have created for your reception. Thank you so much for being here. Good Abend. So there's just the, yeah. Oh, wonderful. That's wonderful. Uh, the chancellor has said she will join the reception for 15 minutes. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yes, we will come together. Is, is this the, the number one? Here we go. Yeah. These are the, the alumni uh, American Fulbright Board of Directors who has come. Okay. Ich weiß gar nicht, welches Foto war das. Ladies and gentlemen, the Chancellor has agreed to stay for a few minutes at the reception. You will have a chance to talk to her, um, maybe. Please, please be respectful of the space around her um, and no selfies, please. Thank you.